This episode of the Out of Bounds Podcast is sponsored by Fisher Skis, and you can visit them at www.fishersports.com. I'm fucking tired. What's up, guys? It's, it's Adam with the Out of Bounds Podcast. Let me get my clap. Hello, hello, hello. This is the Out of Bounds Podcast. My name is Adam Jabber, and we have a wonderful episode for you today with one of the icons in the sport. Um, Glenn Plake is on the show today, and I could not have enjoyed this conversation anymore. Um, like, point blank. The dude can talk forever, and it is uh, talking of value, which is a pretty rare thing, I think. Um, I, yeah, like I said, I fully enjoyed this. I'm going to let this episode do the talking for itself almost two hours so buckle up it is uh like i said one of the most enjoyable conversations i've had that'll we'll we'll leave it at that we kind of talk about a little bit of everything from snowboarding to the new ripstick tour to man there's there's a lot here okay so i just recorded like 10 minutes ago so sorry i'm still processing one of the icons one of the legends in sport and rightfully so never talked to a more genuine human being in my life so with all that being said a lot going on right now, outofcollective.com. Uh, you can still get gear guides. We still have a few available. Get what I think is the most relevant gear guide, period. It is not blisters, gear, Bible, or whatever they call it. It is not ski mag in print. It is not whoever else makes a gear guide right now. It's simple. It's comic book style. It gives you what you need to know. It's blunt. It's honest. I tried to be very real about the reviews that I wrote. Most importantly, we have guest submissions that are incredible and thoughtful and from people who actually ski the skis that they are talking about. It is not a one-time demo, a two-time demo. I reached out to some amazing people and asked them to talk about the setups that they actually care about and that they ski on the regular basis. So they did that. So go to outofcollective.com. Get yourself a gear guide. Get yourself a print of the cover. Shane McFalls killed it on the cover. It's it's if nothing else, it is the best cover in a gear guide that I that I can remember. And that's not because art versus photography, whatever. It's just a really really well done cover, um, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So, outofcollective.com. Moving on, uh, we have a new sponsor of the show. Some of you may have seen. I have this very much way too nice van. Uh, for how much of a pile of garbage that I am uh, that I've been rolling around in for a little while. And it is, uh, it's an Alpine Vans. Alpine Vans basically makes your all-purpose adventure mobile. Uh, it is the same van that you'll see Cody Townsend rolling around in the 50 Project. It has everything. It has a bed. It has a sink. It has a stove. It has solar on the roof. It has a bike tray that rolls out for your convenience it has a heated closet, okay? It's got a work table. The seats rotate. It sleeps basically three people. I'm like still completely in shock that I am even getting to use one of these things for the time being. I want one so badly for the rest of my life. If you are interested in Alpine Vans, hit up alpinevans.com. You can also email my wonderful friend Todd, Todd at Alpine Vans. Hit that man up, go to PA, or just whatever. Call him up. He'll get you one. He'll make it happen. The dude is uh, the dude's incredible. And honestly, we should talk about real quick. The guy just has so much passion for the sport. And I'm like, I love working with people like that. People who are just genuine and they're just happy to be here. And they're like, they want to make an impact any way they can. This dude's doing it with Vans, like Adventure Mobiles. It's, it's pretty insane. So AlpineVans.com. Thank you to Todd. Thank you to the crew. Those guys hooked me up so hard. So I appreciate them very much. Next, our friends at Sierra Nevada Brewing. Uh, obviously, a lot going on at Sierra Nevada. Been a great partner for us. One of the things I'd like to talk about the most, especially in a time when it feels like a lot of people are drinking less. Um, if you are looking for a product that still is excellent, tastes really good, gives you that kind of like beer feel, and honestly, it's just like, it, it's just healthy. It's just good for you. Like zero alcohol, zero calories. There's nothing to it. Hop Splash is available from Sierra Nevada. You can get it on their website. You don't have to be 21 to drink it. And it is the only product on their site that you do not have to be 21 years of age to consume. 
So uh, go and get yourself some Hop Splash. You can also check out any of the amazing flavors that they have at SierraNevada.com, including Narwhal, Bigfoot, Hoptimum, and Barrel Age Narwhal. There's there's a lot going on at Sierra Nevada's website right now. There is a lot of product that we should talk about, and we will at another point. But for now, be sure to leave a review of the show. Be sure to talk about this episode with your friend share this with a friend i mean this is this is one that i really enjoyed and i think you will too um leave us a review on itunes leave us a review on spotify and i am not going to blabber on anymore even about the wonderful sierra nevada product that is on the screen enjoy the episode with the legend that is glenn blake what has that relationship been like for you working because this was one of my questions was kind of talking about the pit fiber relationship because it made sense. The launch video made sense, like full spandex kit. Like, I mean, it like it all makes sense. It all aligns perfectly. So how uh-huh. how did that whole thing work? And why? Like, I don't know. Why do you want to be a part of it? Right? Like you said, people are taking stuff too serious, but that's kind of always been Pit Fiber's well, jam. I think it's easy to tell the truth, and uh, and that's why, like, with the launch video and all these different things. I mean, it's simple to not make stuff up um and maybe just take the take a shot at yourself maybe yeah. that's the funniest thing to do or maybe that's the most genuine thing to do is kind of you know you don't need to create something and and with that same thing said I, so yeah we so some some actual um uh dialogue was taking place uh over the phone or you know within each other and it wasn't until i i I said, well, I'll go, go ahead and send you an email and this and that. And then I realized that this email was in fact a year ago that I just never, for whatever reason answered or I missed it or whatever the heck. And that was quite funny. And then the other funny thing that was, was going on was I was, um, anytime I'd call their phone numbers, I'd never leave my nut, my, um, my, um, I'd never leave my name or number. I'd always act like I was an automobile <laughs> insurance salesman. And um, that's why in the launch video, I'm acting like an automobile insurance segment or salesman because it went on for about a week or two until I was like, hey, why don't you call me back, you know, or whatever and, and doing all these different things and, and then realized, wait a minute, that automobile insurance commercial is the same number as Plague's. <laughs> <laughs> so that went on for about a week before we finally started talking to each other. That was pretty funny. Um, and then, um, no, I just, I, um, I just love the idea of, um, of being with people that are genuine and, and, uh, let's say comfortable with themselves. And, and I don't really give a damn if you don't necessarily agree with me or, or, um, or, um, disagree with me. Um, it's, you know, we're all our own people and, you know, we respect each other, of course, but, um, at the same time, we are who we are, and, and let's go have some dang fun. And, and if you want to wear pit vipers, and I want to wear pit vipers, and she wants to wear pit vipers, and whatever. And it, it's it's just kind of funny. There's no doubt about it. When you have your pits on, you kind of – I'm not saying you're in an exclusive club, but you kind of <laughs> – underneath the shade, you kind of give each other a wink. Yeah, for sure. It's the Jeep wave except less douchey. Yeah, it's like the or Jeep more, wave. Or more douchey. I don't know. It might be both. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 the beauty is it doesn't matter yeah which one exactly it is. <laughs> it's it's funny dude like they a lot of people look at pit viper and they're like oh like fucking frat bros wear these whoever wears these but like it's not true right. everybody wears pit vipers and they're actually really that's fucking so good true. people like they're good people and that's what's cool about no, it is like they can be amazing. loose they can like toe that line where shit's a little edgy but they can still be like genuinely right. good human beings no, and that's it. I think, and I think as human beings, we need to, you know, that's what's so cool about things. It's like, yeah, you're not, your life isn't mine and mine isn't yours, right. but it, we need to listen and respect and, and enjoy and maybe learn about each other. And, and um, yeah, the fact that the National Guard was using my property to do maneuvers this year and the guy pulls up and says, hey, is it all right if we use this road? You know, so we're going to be doing maneuvers down here. I'm all, yeah, that's great. That's great. And, by, and, and of course he had a set of pit vipers on, you know, one of the <laughs> helicopter pilots. And, and, um, and at the same time, he's looking at me like, Hey man, nice glasses. I'm like, I like yours too. Uh, and then at the same time, all my buddies, kids that just love wearing pits. And, um, it's just funny. Even, even like say lifties, you know, when you're at the, you know, at the ski area and you see a lifty with a set of pits on, it, it, it's just kind of cool. We're all just kind of like say giving each other a bit of a wink, like you say, the Jeep wave type theory. And, um, and it's uh 
Uh, and it's not a matter of, oh, you're this or you're that or, you know, all these labels and, and all these things that we're so-called identified with. And Fifth Number really doesn't have an identity to be anything Yeah. You know, other than, um, you know, they're, they're mellow, you know. Yeah, for sure. What? Except so, if you're racist. Actually, there's a lot of people that think yeah, you're racist if you wear They're not them. racist. <laughs> and they're actually very anti-racist. Like, they're donating. Oh, they're not? If they well, see, what the heck? Why am I wearing them for? They, God dang it, I thought they were racist. <laughs> Uh, pulled the wool what right over your deal, eyes, though, dude. Did you hear about that story? Like one guy has a set of pit vipers on and, and so all of a sudden they had like a huge like deal where they had to go like, you know, say, no, we're, we're just a bunch of dumb skiers from, from snowbird that had a funny idea on a tram dock. Right. We're not really racist. <laughs> yeah. And I like it though, dude, they've been not the racism. I like the fact that they are donating money to causes that are relevant. Like whatever the racist person or whatever the shithead is yeah. like doing, they go and they donate yeah. basically towards whatever yeah. it is that's against what this person is doing. And they've done it multiple times. Like they're just trying to show that they're like, yeah, shut it down. Exactly. Like they're trying to align themselves correctly in a positive way, but also be like, again, toe that line. That's like edgy and like themselves. Yeah. Which and I, what I also love, and I, I now would turn this into dang pit, but I, for infomercial, <laughs> we'll have to charge them. Um, uh, <laughs> um, by the way, the telephone is next month. <laughs> um, they uh, they are a bunch of skiers, and that's what I re really love too. So many sunglass companies come from the beach culture or the surf culture or you know the city culture, and uh, the fact that Pit Vipers literally you know came from the tram dock. That's pretty cool. I, I really love that aspect of it in the world of sunglass companies. Yeah, for sure. It's a weird, you know, we got to be skiers or skiers and we got to respect um, each other. We're so, it's like we, we don't have enough. Uh, how do I say it? It's like, we don't have enough um, belief in ourselves as skiers. Like being a skier isn't good enough. So we got to go align ourselves with the sideways sport culture. Or we got to go align ourselves with the other cult, you know, culture. Um, I think skiing is good enough and proof, proof shows that we've had some, you know, wonderful brands uh, come from the skiing culture that has, in fact, entered the mainstream. But it's it's quite funny that, you know, you go through Chamonix and you have a bunch of um, surf culture brands dominating Rue de Picard or you go to you go to a you know, big ski area somewhere. And there'll be these boutique stores that are surf cultures. And yet if you go down to the to the surf cities, you don't see any ski culture there. Yeah. Uh, I, I, there should be there used to be a little bit anyways. Is that weird to you? Like, it seems like people aren't as proud to be skiers, right? Like, it's like they're not – like, when you're a snowboarder, right, everybody goes and they say, mm -hmm. like, oh, I snowboard, right? You hear less and less people are, like, admitting and, like, happy to put their hand up, like, hi, I'm a skier. This is what I do because it wasn't associated with being – cool right like snowboard was the cool edgy thing for a little while no it went like went 20 years of being pretty it, uncool exactly no doubt and, about it and it's getting there now but we're still kind of in this age where you kind of have to explain why it's cool to a certain extent like some people don't like i think you've done a good job at not day, explaining I, it i was at the tire shop today you know and yeah you know, this is you know glenn the pro snowboarder i'm like hey i'm back up i'm a pro <laughs> skier uh, you know people do that to you <laughs> uh, every day every day and they're not, it's not, they're not, intent, they're not, they're not, you know, right. I'm not feeding the fire. Don't think I'm sitting here relic digging up freaking old, you know, Burton relic fight of ski or snowboarder, but there's no doubt about it. Uh, um, the, um, you know, the, the, the society definitely still thinks, you know, snowboarding is it. And reality is skiing's been it and always has been it. And yeah, we kind of played a little bit of second string there for a while, but, um, no, I, I think, uh, no. And, and again, there's no such thing as ski or snowboard or that was literally a marketing campaign by a giant corporation and screw them. I hope they go away someday, but, um, 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 uh, um, they, uh, the, it never really was really alive in the, in the field, so to speak, unless they fed it. But anyways, back to what you're saying, is it cool to be a skier? We're kind of geeks, dude. We're freaking, you know, we live at the end of some dirt road somewhere. We hang out in some, you know, screwball little town in, um, in, uh, in, um, hang on a second. I'm trying to do, oh, oh no, I've lost your video. Oh, there you are. Um, there we go. Um, we hang out in the middle of some, um, 
I got sick of looking at my face. I'm like, why am I looking at my, my face? Um, uh, we hang out in some little town in some, you know, end of some dirt road up in the hills somewhere. Um, and, you know, we're kind of outcast. We go play around. We, we ride around on our skis and do our thing. And, and yet the sideways culture is just the opposite. They live in cities. They live in giant metropolises. And, um, and they surf and they skate and they do their things. And so it's, it's just a totally different thing. I've, I, I, I always, I sometimes ask the question is skiing a rural sport or is it a, um, a Metro sport? And people say, Oh, it's a, you know, it's the skiing. you're out in the outdoors and blah, blah, blah. And then I ask the question, okay, is surfing a Metro sport or is it a, uh, uh, an outdoor or not outdoor, a rural sport? And so I asked the question, is surf, what do you think? Is surfing a, um, a rural sport or a metro sport? I would think that it's a rural sport, to me at least. I mean, I don't know, though. It's, it's tough because you can say it's a metro sport, right? Because uh-huh. it, you're uh-huh. so close to the cities. Like, everything's based on the beach. And what is the beach? The beach is where everybody flocks. And that's where the vacation areas are. So I get that part of it. But there's so much beach culture exactly. that is just like you're outside, right? Like, that's the whole bit is you're waiting on a wave. Correct. Which is very nice. Ne- so... I guess in terms of like city. So placement, it's an outdoor yes. sport. There's no doubt about it, but it's a Metro but sport. I get a, the point. Yeah, the, yeah. 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 And most people go, what are you talking about? You're surfing. You're I'm like, yeah, in LA. Yeah. That's a, yeah. <laughs> you're it, surfing no, you make a good Sydney. point. Yeah. You're surfing. All these major surf yeah. spots are massive cities yeah. where most ski spots are not. Yeah. <laughs> it's too difficult. Most ski spots is, especially in the, you know, your day-to-day ski spot, whether it's a funny little local ski hill or, you know, or, or even a major resort, they're, they're even, I mean, the, the amount of major resorts that are tied directly to the city, there's not very many of them, you know, that are where, where your stones throw from, from a true Metro situation. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, the only one but, that comes uh, anyways, the um, so that- with that said, I think skiing's kind of an outcast and we're always going to be kind of an outcast and that's why skiing is skiing. I mean, they're really, I don't believe there is anything like skiing, you know, people, Oh, you know, when windsurfing, you know, was big, Oh, it's like skiing. Um, all right. Yeah. I windsurf a lot, but I don't think it's like skiing. Uh, oh, rollerblading. It's like skiing, uh, mountain biking, mountain biking. It's like skiing. Like it's not really like skiing. It's, I mean, it's fun to do and we do it the same and, and certainly a, a, a certain, uh, some shared lifestyle, but it, it's not like skiing at all. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so I think skiing is stands alone and it is what it is. And, um, and so, yeah, I guess back to the question, are people proud to be skiers? I think there's no doubt about it, but at the same time, the world doesn't necessarily know what a skier really is in today's mm-hmm. world. We've been distracted by all these other images. And so all of a sudden they just kind of lump us into the group, which is fine. Whatever. Yeah. How, is that something that should change in your eyes? Like, does that matter at all? Like, do we try to get more people to understand what skiing is like culturally? Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, because I think it's, um, um, you know, a lot of it, what is skiing to most people? Is it a holiday? Is it because the neighbors are going? Is it a lifestyle? Mm-hmm. Is it what you do the rest of your life? Is it what you do with your family? I mean, all, yeah, it's all of those, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it, absolutely. It's all of those. Um, um, I think, um, you know, the fact that skiing is being, um, probably more manipulated by, let's say the cruise slash vacation industry, mm. um, that's, that's, a, it's slightly, slightly, uh, troubling, I guess, you know, on, on, um, cause I think skiing is a, is something that people should be able to do on a day-to-day basis, whether it's a small little ski area down the road, or if you happen to live at a big giant ski area, so be it. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, I, it's, um, yeah, I wish more people would understand what skiing is, you know, it, it lost a little bit of popularity as you say, but like so many sports, I mean, where's barefoot water skiing nowadays? Where's, um, (laughs) where's all the, you know, where's, uh, for that matter, where's tennis other than it being, you know, you know, you know, giant tournaments and stuff, but your average person kind of goes and plays a game of tennis or even, like I do a lot of road cycling. Okay. That's fun. But all these sports got um, kind of overlooked by the, during the media explosion. And now all of a sudden, I, I think it's funny when you have a kid like sees barefoot water skiing for the first time, like we'll be barefoot at the lake and you'll just have this little kid just like 
freaking out because that <laughs> he cannot see that anywhere else. Like it does, it's not even in his world, right? Um, even though all the parents and all the uncles and aunts and everything, you know, they're, let's say, in their surf boats, you know, doing free surf. But, man, you show some little kid barefoot water skiing and they're like, what the heck? So I think it's just a generation that may have missed it. And the same type of thing with skiing with all the youth and the kids that are into skiing and, you know, where maybe dad is a snowboarder and the kids skiing. I think it's quite funny that, like, I'm not going to say it's a cycle and it changes, but it's, I, I think there's a whole bunch of sporting activities that may all of a sudden become popular just because they've not been exposed to a generation mm. uh, or today's generation. Yeah. I think that's valid. It's, it's funny, right? Like it, at some points I'm like, yes, yeah, skiing has this amazing culture. The people that are invested in it, it's like, you all feel like family. It's, mm -hmm. there's something, there's this shared interest. Right. But at the same time, to your point, like the kind of commercialization of it, the part that like does feed a lot of people makes skiing right. feel very much like bowling. Right. Like sometimes I tell somebody that I'm a skier and I go ski. It's like, that would be like telling them that I go bowling all the time. Right. Or like that, that's my right, passion right. in life is going and doing this weird niche thing that, that people don't really understand completely yet. And it's, it's hard because skiing takes a few steps, right. For people to really get it. Either they see somebody that is like fully invested right. in it and fully involved in it and they get it based on their energy or they take what they know as an experience, which a lot of times is a first day on the hill and first day on the hill, as we all know, like, right. can go one way or the other, right? You can love it. It'll, you'll kill, you'll figure it out. And you're like, I want to do this forever. Or it'll be terrible. Yeah. You have a horrible time. You're walking I'll down never, the hill and yeah. you're like, fuck, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. You know, I'm never going to do this again. Yeah. How did, how did my neighbor talk me into this? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Or boyfriend or girlfriend or anything else. Yeah. It's a, it's a very yeah. bizarre thing. And it's uh it, it's kind of what makes it special though. Right? Like you kind of have to get it to get it. No, that's why I say it. There, there's nothing like it. There's yeah. nothing like it. You know, the only thing that, I, if I was to say negative on skiing is all these other things that we're talking about don't necessarily take, um, a, you know, the level of commitment is in, you don't need to buy your ski pass. You don't need to have a lift. You know, you don't, they're, they're free for the most part. Once you make your investment, you know, right. when people always say, Oh, skiing is too expensive. I'm like, yeah, there's no doubt about it. A version of skiing that's way too expensive, for sure. <laughs> but there's this other version or there's other versions of skiing that aren't that expensive, but at the same time, you do got to make a commitment. I mean, you got to go buy your dang lift ticket or you got to go buy your pass. Yeah. But if we were to say, hey, you want to go mountain biking today, and you don't have a mountain bike and you just went down and said, well, I'll go get one. Well, you're in for a couple of grand on a, on a bad one. Right. And so I guess it's the same way. If you don't say, okay, I'm going to make a commitment to be a skier and I'm going to go do a little preparation prior to that. And that means, man, I might have to go to a ski swap or I might have to go you know, by the, by the past in, in September or whatever the heck it is, um, to make it so that you can do it anytime you want, I guess, where those, where some of these other activities, you don't have that, that, um, you know, you don't have to have that, um, you don't have to have that ticket, you know, and obviously with backcountry growing in popularity and, um, you know, people realizing that the skiing experience is something more than just yo-yoing up and down the, the local ski hill, um, um, that, that obviously opens up another opportunity, but it's different. I, I, I feel like I'm, 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 I'm beating on society a little bit, but I, I'm going to continue <laughs> as you um, should, as you should, and I'm going to beat, I'm going to beat on some other things. So our high school used to have, a, a, a um, a, um, uh, two pomelifts right behind the high school. No shit. It was ran by a club and it was, it was, you know, and, Obviously, there's some places in, in New England and elsewhere. There's a couple of rope toes and what have you. And they tore, they shut that thing down because it was called, it was a liability. There's no way we can't have this as a liability. You can't have a ski area. You can't have a municipal ski area operating in the town. Mm. And yet they can build dirt jumps that are like 25 <laughs> feet high. <laughs> that like, they're crazy. There's, there's no ski patrol there. There's no like, old guy telling us we can't jump. There's nobody telling us we're going too fast. And they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more to build these dirt jump parks. Yeah. And yet nobody's, nobody's hooking up the palm lift, the old ski hill anymore. I find that interesting that the, the, 
municipal aspect of skiing is definitely completely gone. And yet, and as much as I love skateboarding, the same thing. I mean, another skateboard park? How, how about we put a friggin' rope tope up the, up the hill in mm. the park instead of another dang skateboard park? What's wrong with that? No, nothing. I don't funny. think. I don't think there's anything. The thing is, is like it, it's funny because I was talking oh, to somebody steam. about this. That's what's wrong with it. It's, it's exactly that's what that's it is. what's wrong with they it. They don't get it, and it's the insurance <laughs> thing, right? Like the insurance fucks everybody because that's one of the main differences between like skiing in Europe, say, and skiing in the U.S. Like everything, right. skiing is subsidized there, like in a lot of different areas. Here, right. you're paying fucking two hundred dollars sure. for a Vail lift ticket right now. You know, it's just like part of that's insurance, part of that's right. expensive, part of it's Vail's a piece of shit. Like, there's a lot of things that go into that, but right. at the same time, like that affects the overall experience because you have people like that high school that are like, look. You can't have this. It's a liability. Like somebody's going to sue somebody and then everything's mm -hmm. fucked, you know? It's funny, huh? It's, it's and like I said, that dirt jump. Oh my God. They're, they're like huge. You, like you can't even neck. ride your bike up them, let alone yeah. jump them. <laughs> yeah. You break your fucking neck. A hundred percent. First try for sure. First try. <laughs> <laughs> try. I, I don't know. Man. Oh, well, no big. It's fun to talk about. I don't. I don't have any answers for it, but I, it, I do like. I don't mind that, mind bringing it up to some people's attentions. So maybe someone else will have the damn answers. Maybe. I don't. I don't know, man. That's a tough one. I. I always wonder, like, is that a good thing or a bad thing, right? Like, where there are some barriers to entry into the sport, right? Like, people can't just walk on. Like, it takes a commitment. It takes like you have to learn how to put your bindings on. You have to go and get the gear set up. It has to be like good enough to get down the hill. You have to go and buy a lift ticket, like. A lot of that stuff could definitely be poles. eliminated, right? You got to deal with those poles. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of shit, man. There's a lot of shit that's included. And I just wonder if that's a good or a bad thing sometimes. Like, cause on the plus it's like, yeah, it is nice to do it right. And kind of figure out what that means to do it right. And like kind of start with a strong right. base. But at the same time, it's like a lot of people don't do it because there's too many fucking things going on. It's like somebody comes into a ski shop and they're like, I want to go skiing. You're like, all right, you need jacket, pants, socks, goggles, helmet, poles, gloves uh skis and then you need to go yeah. buy a bunch of shit and pay for it every time you go you know what i mean like i think i i think about this a bunch because i you, you and so great you got everything now let's actually go right <laughs> right so now we got to get the car got to load all this crap in the car we got to drive a couple <laughs> three or four hours if we're lucky um you know usually the weather kind of sucks or it's something um you know, and then the same thing goes over. You park. Uh, maybe you got a good parking lot. Maybe you're out in the mud somewhere trying to do this one-legged chicken dance to put your boots on before it tips over and falls into the mud. <laughs> and it just goes on and on. And then you can't reach up to the, get your ski rack out because you got your ski boots on. And I mean, okay, we can make the comedy go on and on and on. And yet, you, there's people that go skiing. So here we kind of go back to this whole thing that, like, there's really nothing like it. Yeah. People are willing <laughs> it's to really hard to explain. You jump through and, a lot um, of hoops. But I think maybe some of that, those idiosyncrasies that are so bizarre about it, maybe, maybe, maybe that's what we should talk about more. You know, maybe the fact that we are having fun in the harshest environment of, you know, in the, uh, in the world, you know, the, maybe, um, you know, I mean, let's face it, that nothing, you know, really exist in the mountains too much. I mean, yeah, we have some small animals here and there, but I mean, it's a, it's a strange activity to go play around in the mountains. You strap these things on your feet that have no brakes and you go, the object is to go fast. Right. <laughs> um, I, I find I, I, those are the things maybe we should tell more people about. I, um, you know, um, they would never do it, but I used to make a joke. <laughs> like when I was doing some stuff for the, uh, uh, one of the, like, ski foundations or something uh you know the it wasn't learn to ski but it was um it was one of the like i always said the national ski association should come should come out especially in the early days of the x games and all this stuff there was like they should do an ad that just says go ski and you can break your leg doing it <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah they didn't they didn't do that they didn't take my <laughs> advice <laughs> but I mean, I'm like, well, wait a second. You're competing against sports, you know, that have things like the X Games. They, you're competing against sports that have, you know, this notoriety of, no, this is, you know, fast and furious and dangerous, and you're hanging it out there. And it's like, so why don't we talk about it? Because we, we have all that stuff. 
and then some. <laughs> and you throw in the really, really like harsh environment of the mountains. This is amazing. So yeah. now it's, it's, um, yeah, it's skiing. It's- <laughs> I think, uh, I think skiing needs to not be a sport too. I think too many people think of it as a sport and not a pastime. I think it's a pastime. I think it's like fishing. I think it's a, a way to blow off the day. I got criticized for saying, um, you know, the skiing is the best way to waste time. Um, and I still mean that. I think it's just a, an amazing way to waste a bunch of time, Yeah, which is maybe the, you know, that that's a, there's, a, I, I, I mean that. And, and I, I, I just think it's, I think too many people uh, equate because they're paying for that ticket. They think there's some sort of, you know, value that needs to come into play. Well, I bought this, so I need to make 42 runs. Okay. You know, or I did this, so I need to have this. I need to have, and where, like, if we go fishing or something, we, I can catch more fish than you, and I might joke about it, but it's, it's not. I, some people fish for sport. That'd be, you know, maybe go get your outboard motor and get after it. But yeah, <laughs> um, in general, ninety nine point nine 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 percent of people do not fish for sport; they fish for pastime. Right. And that's what you think skiing should be like. So let me ask you. I think skiing is a pastime. I don't think it's a sport. I think it's a sport for a very, 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 very small group. So for those people that are doing it as a sport, like what, what does that mean to you? Like, are you interested in things like say the Olympics or things like, uh, X games? Like, is that a, is that of interest to you at all? Like, because that, that like competitive aspect at that highest level, so to speak. I love watching it. I love, um, uh, I, I, I love watching world cup. I think world cup is mind boggling. Yeah. Um, but I also, I think they're the, they're spectacles of, of the sport and that's what they are. And that's, what's amazing about them. Um, and, uh, I, I really appreciate them because they're spectacles. You're going to find that absolute highest level of whatever discipline that they've put the parameters around, whether yeah. it's ski racing or ski jumping or freestyle or, or whatever it is, um, you know, those parameters have been set and then the competitors and the coaches and everybody achieve and push the limit way out beyond anything, um, you could ever imagine. And I appreciate that, that, that aspect of it. Um, as far as, um, you know, anybody going to watch a world cup, you should, absolutely. You should, I do any chance I get it's, it's mind boggling those athletes. And they are those, that is the sport aspect of the sport or of skiing. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, what, what they achieve, right? Yeah. And we should all, we should all recognize that and probably get even put more recognition to it because they're doing something that we should only be inspired by. You're never going to get there. Yeah. It's, it's a very weird thing, right? Like it's, I feel like some people do take skiing very seriously. Like you said, because they're spending so much money on it. They feel like they need to have Uh this, like this push, this physical gain out of it sometimes. And I guess like Mm -hmm. on the touring side of it, it's a slightly different conversation because that's like mandatory. Like you're a hundred percent, you know, like the shit out of yourself, whether you're going slow or you're going fast like that, that's just part of the game. If you're taking the lift, right. you're like, there's no reason to take it all that seriously because like, who the fuck are you competing against? Right? Like you're just going out there and you're trying to have fun. You're trying to like, you're literally passing time and in the most positive yeah. way that I think you can. Right. And everybody chooses their method. And for us, it's skiing. For some right. people, it's fishing. For some people, it's both. And some people, it's fucking bowling. Like who knows? Sure. Sure. So it's kind of an interesting bit, but I, uh. Yeah, skiing, skiing. This is like all to the point of skiing is very unique. If there's nothing really like it, <laughs> oh, it is not. Again, I, I, it, I just it. There's absolutely nothing like it. Yeah, um, uh, and, and you can you can break apart any part of it and go. Yeah, you're right. There's nothing really like that. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Let me ask you this then: how how do you feel about things like or resorts like Alta Say or Mad River that are still like skiing exclusive? you know, or Deer Valley, like places that are only allowing skiers. Is that, is that a good thing in your mind or a bad thing in your mind? Like, cause I kind of go back and forth. I, in my, my initial reaction is it should be open for everybody. Whoever the fuck wants to slide and go do stuff downhill. Like that's my initial, Correct. but Correct. I was wondering how you feel about it. I, I don't, it doesn't really matter how I feel, but I definitely, I, I my observation has been, um, <laughs> There was no doubt about it, a change of, of, um, 
I'm not going to say cult. Uh, it, there was a change of environment, I guess, in the ski areas as snowboarding became more um, accepted at the ski areas. Yeah. And um, and I think without being an old fogey, without being a stick in the mud, um, I think some of those ski areas that are not allowing it, if you were to go there um, and see how maybe some and maybe it maybe it is bad um that it's still like that but some of those ski areas especially mad river you're going to see an original version of let's say skiing mm. that wasn't necessarily influenced by the metro influx of the sideways culture that that arrived with the snowboard side of things yeah i think that's and, totally and i don't i don't i don't think we shouldn't but i mean the idea of me dropping an f-bomb in a lift line when I was growing up would have basically removed me from the ski area the rest of my rest of the year, end of story. And now mm. it's, it's, I mean, culture's changed, of course, but I just think that them being, I, I got, you know, when, when I said in an old Warren Miller movie, they said, if you had a magic wand, they said, what? And I said, I'd like to go back to the day snowboarding was invented. It wasn't to, because I didn't like snowboarding. I was hanging out at Donner ski ranch with Joel from sessions with, with Damian Sanders with the early days of Palmer. I, I was there. We were all there. I hated skiing too. It was this old fogey freaking t you know, turtleneck wearing, you know, BS. I was a mogul skier that wanted to kick ass, listen to bad music and, you know, chase the same girls that every snowboarder was chasing. And we were all hanging out and we were hanging out in these little ski areas, i.e. Donner ski ranch, um, uh, you know, um, slide mountain all these weird little ski areas that only that did allow snowboarding and we we're all everything was fine nobody cared we were just like no it, it needs to be different we we're much more along the lines of the you know the 70s uh hot dogging culture mm. of skiing um than anything else and then you know lo and behold it became this kind of like us versus them and then at the same time the ski areas the way they handled it was terrible. The way they said, and, and we can go find evidence of, of, oh, yeah, so I'm not allowed to take a jump because I'm a skier, but they're building parks for you to take jumps that we're not allowed to enter. Right. I mean, what the heck was that all about? Right. What the hell was that? Yeah. And you're telling me that there's not a divide here and that this wasn't literally put on by, by certain people and certain you know, organizations within the industry. Um, because, um, and, and so with that said, I just think that the reason some of these ski areas still to this day say, we don't want snowboarders. I don't think they don't want snowboarders. I think what they don't want is that, let's say kind of Metro, um, what the word am I looking for? Um, um, and not being polite. It's just, um, I can't think right now. It's just that. No, the manners, I get, they yeah. Don't, it, it they is, don't, the, the yeah, ma yes, no manners came with it. It became just like, you can do whatever the hell you want. I mean, the old, you know, just all the old stupid snowboard jokes that we all hear. Oh, you know, how do, how do you snowboarders run into each other? You know, meet each other. Oh, Hey, sorry, dude. You know, all that, whatever, yeah. you know, all these idiosyncrasies that, and all these stereotypes of snowboarders, that's the worst. I know tons of snowboarders are freaking great friends of mine and the stereotypes that they have to live with of, well, they're just going to come here and there. And, but at the same time, you drug a freaking bus up to the ski area. Yeah. So that it could be a thing. I mean, <laughs> and I can go back to the, the, the industrialization of the mountain because of the snowboard, I think is why those ski areas say we don't like that. We're not mm. going to bring that to the, you know, that, that industrialization of the mountain environment. I think that's why some of those skiers are still saying, no, we're not going to, we don't want it, yeah. which is sad because I don't think it would come now. I think if you, if you allowed them now, they wouldn't, that era is gone, but I still think they're afraid of that era. Yeah. I think uh, Deer Valley, honestly, I don't think anybody gives a fuck about like as snowboarders. I've never heard somebody complain about not going to Deer Valley, you know, like it is great. No. Like, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but nobody, no snowboarder that I know has ever been like, Right. I'm missing out there. It's always Alta and it's always Mad River. And Mad River is like a unique situation because you go there and it's almost like, like you said, it's a relic. It's a monument. It's the same way that it was. Like right. it's a genuine article, you know? 
So changing that now would be a little well, weird, I feel like, right? Like, I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of things well, that change. I also but. think Mad River, from a um, from a practical standpoint, because of the terrain at Mad River, and we need to yeah. admit that snowboarding is different than skiing, but the braking position in skiing is standing sideways. That's not really a skiing it's a skiing position. Of course it is, but it's not the regulars, you know? So, um, the braking position on the snowboard is the strongest position on a snowboard because you're facing dead down, you know, you're in a parallel stance on the snowboard. And I think, and I'm not making fun of squeegee and I'm not making fun of, but I think because of <laughs> mad river snowpack and because of mad rivers, I'm not stupid. I'll call a spade. I don't care, but <laughs> ma'am, snow mad rivers, snowpack and mad rivers terrain will be destroyed without a doubt if if the braking position the natural position of a snowboard was going down those little kuars it would be scraped to freaking dirt and ice which is already is anyways <laughs> yeah exactly that was what i was gonna say is like i don't know that we necessarily need more traffic at mad river like maybe they want a little more traffic they want to drum up a little more money but that place gets fucking ruined to the bone pretty often. You know what I mean? Right. Like, it's like down to the so dirt. So what's the answer? You, oh, well, you have a snowboarding area only area. No. Oh, okay, now yeah. we're back to the same old thing that we were just talking about. Now we're separating you know, them, but, and that's dumb too. So it, it's kind of interesting, though, but how that, you know, that, and again, oh, gosh, we're going down such a freaking <laughs> can of worms. But in the old days, you know, I, I don't, I don't think, First, and I don't think a 10 day skier is going to ride the gondola at Mammoth because their friends talked them into it. They're yeah. going to go, mm, I don't know about that. That looks pretty sketchy up there for me. Yeah. Where a 10 hour snowboarder will be going up there without yeah. question. <laughs> yeah. That's, a, I mean, because it's they know they can go. They can go to this braking position, whether it's toe side or heel side, they yeah. can go to this safe position and go the whole way down the mountain. Yeah. And I, again, I'm not, I'm not trashing snowboarders cause they're freaking amazing. They're mind boggling. I love everything. Some of the, some people do, but there's no doubt about it. The general public. Um, yeah. Yeah. So from a snow management st standpoint, there's no doubt about it. You cannot deny that there's been a, a bit of a change there. But we can also argue the fat ski has done the same damn thing. You know, a lot of people point, on yeah. fat skis doing the same thing. They're where they're not supposed to be, so to speak. Yeah. It's given people a lot of confidence. They're sliding all over the place. And, like, sometimes it's a good thing, right? It allows people to ski different terrain. It's a great it allows thing. everybody be like, everybody can yeah. ski whatever they want now. And that's cool because it allows people to push past their comfort zone. So <laughs> there's pluses and minuses yeah. to everything, man. You know, it's like kind of how it goes. It's a great thing for me because I'm a mogul skier and I can ski moguls <laughs> where there's never been moguls before. It's awesome. <laughs> it's uh, a really progressive time right now in mogul ski. <laughs> <yeah. laughs> oh my God. It's yeah. Oh my God. That's really funny. It, so <laughs> let me on this, on this topic, kind of, let me ask you then what, what was the change like for you going into this kind of more progressive shape? Because I think in the last eight to 10 years, we've seen more changes in ski tech than we saw before that for quite some time. Right. Like as soon as basically like rocker came well, out, yeah. wider skis came out, like you start seeing the average width of a ski sold in new England right now is like 95 under foot. If you told me that 10 years ago, I would have thought you were fucking crazy. You know what yeah. I mean? Like there was just no way right, that that no could doubt. happen. So now it's the norm. Like if you're buying something less than 95, you're looking for a carver. Right. So what, what right. was that no, switch it's, up it's, like for it, you? Say that again. What was that switch up like for you? Like, I mean, when everything started changing more and it more. It was difficult for me because, um, so the reason we skied 225s were the reason we skied downhill skis. Yes, there was some stability. Uh, that came with it, especially landing big jumps. It, it, it gave me a platform to land on looking back. It actually was a wider ski, to be honest. I mean, our downhills were wide. They were stiff. They had all these different things. The other thing though, and the real reason we skied big skis was because we could, Yeah, it was like <laughs> you and me go skiing and yeah, you're skiing right along with me and we're doing our thing. And I'm like, yeah, but you're on 195 somewhere in 220s, dude. I'm kicking your ass. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So we did it to increase the difficulty of my my personal um, experience for me, anyways. It was it was really about skiing those downhills because um, I could basically. Mm. Um, so going to the the fatter skis what for me was like, Oh man, it's going to be so like, it's really, it's going to lower my level of, of, of personal, um, technical needs. Cause I need I, to ski the big skis. We had a lot of technical needs that you had to do. And, I mean, we laugh whenever we put somebody on a pair of straight skis. Now as a joke, they just fall over on the, yeah. they, they think they're going to ski and they you just watch them fall over. If they have skiing skills, they make the adjustments and it's, it's fun to watch the um, evolution, even though it might be in less than one run, you know, yeah. but halfway down the run, you're like, okay, they're starting to figure it out. Um, so um, yeah, that was hard for me because I was like, but th th these are like easy to ski on. Um, and they were, and no doubt about it, the benefits are, or are, are, you know, this, there is really no such thing as a, you know, a, a difficult snow condition nowadays where before the mountain used to kick your ass, you'd be at the end of the day and go, all right, that was freaking gnarly. You know, I've been skiing broken crust all day. Mm. Whew, talk about a, a lot of up and down, up and down, up and down, trying to get these things to turn where the new skis, you know, you a little bit of a, a balance adjustment and that's about it. And you, you're going to make it, make it work. I mean, it's still, we still have bad conditions. There's no doubt about that, but, um, so that was kind of interesting from a personal standpoint. I had to swallow the fact that I was giving up this kind of pride that I held pretty close to my heart, to be honest. Um, I'm still happy that I still can ski my big skis. And I do go ski my big skis just for my own, my own sake and my own exploration of technique. I, you know, I don't think people realize how much I love technique and how much I'm intrigued by that, um, by what my skis do and, how I make them do what they do. Mm. Um, but as far as, uh, you know, making those wide skis, but then I think what happened was, okay, rocker, 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 woo, super bananas, and width, 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 width. And, and then we'll have giant skis and giant rocker and blah, 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 blah. And it really became a whole like, oh, you got this much? Well, I got more. You got more and I got less. Uh, and now I think with technology and the ski companies actually – looking at these segments instead of just thinking it was some weird fringe West coast powder ski. Mm. Um, you know, they started looking at different cores, looking at different laminates, looking at different things. Um, and you made the skis actually ski a lot better, not just looking at their dimensions, but they actually do ski really, really well. And now you go, okay, hang on a second. We've got these dimensions that help all these, you know, snow conditions but we've also got these skis that actually ski quite well um mm -hmm. and i think i think that's um for me that was when the transition really i started to really adapt to the bigger skis because i hated the dang things when yeah. you know you'd be skiing on a, you know i i still laugh to be honest you know you'll be skiing hard pack and someone will have their hundreds on underfoot and i'm like why aren't you on like an 88 i mean come on i mean yeah. seriously um, well, they ski great. Yeah, they, they do ski great, but I don't think they ski as good as these 88 ski. Um, and so I still, I'll tend to go a little narrower, um, then, but, I, um, but I think, um, I think the fact that the skis are skiing the way they are and have those, have those widths is, is quite interesting. And that's what really kind of changed it for me. Cause I hated being on a powder ski. I, I, you start on a freaking powder ski. Yeah. Okay, cool. The top thousand feet of the mountain was off and, the rest of the mountain sucked. This is mm. terrible. How can you ski on these things? This is terrible. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't until they got better skiing that I really adapted to them myself. Yeah, it's it's funny. There was this correction like maybe five years ago, six years ago, maybe a little longer, mm -hmm. I guess, where everybody was doing that thing. They were just making everything super wide. And that was like the new trend is everybody was buying 100, 100 104, 110. Like you started seeing it in New England like all the time. And now there's kind of been this correction where everybody's like moved back down and realized like, especially here on the East coast, 88 mm -hmm. through 98 is like really where you want to be. Like 98's your versatile, do everything. Yep. 88's you're like, I mainly ski new England, but sometimes I'll go fuck around in some soft snow. You know, that, that change sure, has been important sure. for people to understand, I think. 
Like that's a, that makes a big difference. Yep. No, I think it was like, okay, you got your brownie points. You got your big fat dumb skis. Now go get something to ski on. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like, I think that's actually kind of what happened though. No, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, I remember being on some stuff that was like 130, like uh, literally 130 underfoot, something like that. Like being on some pontoons or something yeah. like that. And you're skiing right. them and it's like there's three inches of snow on the ground and people are just looking for every yeah. excuse to be out on these things, myself included, because you're so enamored with this idea that you have this big floaty platform. Never mind the fact that it doesn't turn. It doesn't like you couldn't buy a turn on those things. But in soft snow, right, whether right, it's three right. inches or 30 inches, it just it feels good. And people got excited about that idea. Again, myself included. We're interrupting this episode with Glenn Plake to tell you about Rumpel. Rumpel is a sponsor of the Out of Bounds podcast, and they make the original puffy blanket. I, I I love this stuff. It's so good. It's packable. It lives in my new van, um, and I'm, uh, as I've said about 400 times already in this ad, I am a huge fan of Rumpel products. Uh, they Actually, this new one, the Nano Loft travel blanket, is literally the size of a Nalgene. It's crazy. It packs down so small. And the stuff is just dope. And also, I'm talking about this real quick. They are dropping a new Carhartt collab that you should go check out. All the details are on their website. Go to rumple.com. You can use promo code out of bounds and you can save some money if you want to. Otherwise, you know what, dude? If you just want to give them all your money, you can do that too. Go to rumple.com. Get yourself a blanket, a towel, some other gear. They make koozies. They make all kinds of stuff. So rumple.com. Next, we have... The mentioned, which I don't know if it's before or after when we mention Fisher skis in this conversation, but we do talk about Fisher and how good the skis are and how we have made them cool. That's what I'm claiming. I'm claiming that we, a bunch of knuckleheads, have made Fisher cool. Pink Ski Gang might be dead, but never forget. Uh, go to fishersports.com. You can check out all of the best skis that exist in that line, uh, including my personal favorite, the Ranger 108. I love the new color. I think it looks awesome. And more importantly, it skis amazing. The Ranger 102 is the one that's been tried and true. Everybody knows, everybody loves, but they also have the Ranger 96, the Ranger 90, and the standard Ranger, which does still come in pink. That is for basically someone who's looking for a beginner, intermediate, or a junior ski. They make that one. But honestly, just go ski a Ranger Series ski. I'm a huge fan of the product, and we've been giving away one every month for the next couple months. We just did one for the Ranger 108. We'll do one for the 102 next month, and then we'll do another one for the 96 in the following month. So keep up to date on the Instagram, and we'll be giving away some product for Fisher. Fishersports.com. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conversation. Peace. You know, we got to remember the fat ski was invented for people that couldn't ski. It was so that, you know, the heli operations of, of Canada could would send home customers that weren't unhappy yeah. um, because, you know, they'd pay all that money and they'd go heli skiing and they sucked and they freaking went home and went, oh, that sucked. I didn't, I didn't, where they get the fat skis was, oh well, yeah, I got my belt buckle. Check me out because I made all these <laughs> different runs. And, um, and, uh, but, and, but then all of a sudden, you know, the, the free ride, the extreme ski competitions and all this, they grabbed the skis and here it is like some 15 years later, the public who the skis were in fact invented for finally actually get to use them. And it's kind of cool. Cause yeah. I had people flat out, like I'd be at a demo or something like, Hey, you, you want to try our, you know, our, our 100, you know, hundred underfoot. So I'd be like, Oh no, 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 I don't, I'm not a free rider. I'm not, <laughs> you know, I no, I don't do extreme skiing. <laughs> You're like, but they, I mean, people were like, the public was like, no, you grab these wide skis and you immediately like outrun an avalanche and shoot off the biggest <laughs> cliff you could find. <laughs> like, it's not who they were. They weren't made for that. You guys. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they were made for a disconnect. They were made for sugar daddies that couldn't ski a heli ski and you love them. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I love that. I love that. You're right. I mean, that's, it's funny. Like people don't think about that anymore. Like, because that's, that's where it started. And it was just, it was just that kind of thing. And now it's like, everybody has a powder ski in their quiver or at least most people yeah. do. I feel like, especially if you're out West, you yeah. have that big ski to bring out. I'm probably the worst. It'll probably be my demise, but I'm a bit of an elephant. I don't, I, I, I try to pay attention and I don't forget a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> so Funny. let me, let me ask you this then you have a new ski out with Elon. 
uh, yeah. that is very different than anything else they've made in a very long time, if if ever. Yeah. Um. So let's let's talk about that Ripstick Tour 104. What? Why did you want that ski? When we were talking on the phone the other day, you kind of told me like, I put my foot down on this one. This is one I wanted, and it had to be the way I wanted yeah. it. Otherwise, I wasn't doing it. So, tell me a little bit about it. Well, they kept the, obviously the touring market was growing. Um, the rip stick itself was working really, really well as a touring ski. And like so many touring skis, and I, we need to talk about if, if I could say modern touring skis, yep. um, cause I can honestly say I didn't really ever really use touring skis, you know, touring skis were kind of this hut to hut transportation yeah. thing, um, back when, you know, me and Darren Johnson were fall, you know, stumbling around the Sierras, you know, steep skiing or whatever, or when we were in the Alps or whatever, you know, we were, we were using skis in a touring environment. And the same thing was happening there with the ripstick. We had these Alpine skis that were satisfactory to be used in the touring environment. And, um, and everybody noticed that and they were like, well, could we actually make a touring version of that? At, at which point we said, absolutely. I think there's a bunch of improvements that we could make to make it specifically touring. Um, and uh, at the same time, every time Elon would come out with a touring ski, I was not very much involved in it. I was involved in one model about 10 years ago um, that didn't necessarily have too much success. It had a little bit of a fan club, but um, in general, they would come out with this new collection of touring skis. And I'm like, awesome those suck i don't want don't even send me them <laughs> like, seriously i can tell you that right now i don't need any of those you know who the heck did you ask because i think this especially in this modern world of touring and even when you go to like the french alpine club you know the, the classic cafes as we call them um um, they're out on wide skis, out ski touring, you know, they're not on 165, 65 underfoot anymore, you know, with their little hut to hut scene going on. They want to go ahead and do a little, little wiggle through the powder if they can. Um, and so this whole definition of a touring ski has changed into this modern touring ski where I don't think yes there's transportation and yes there's hut to hut and yes there's all this different stuff but there's also a skiing component involved in it too i would not only want to walk up to that place i'd like to ski back down and i'd like to have something so um you know the the, the idea of a to what a touring ski was is um finally got recognized by lawn and they approached me to say Hey, you don't really like our touring skis. You have comments that you're going to make them better or that would, that you think would make them better. Um, and so, uh, they said, we're about ready to embark on a new design, um, on the ripstick tour. We know you guys are ski touring on your ripsticks. Uh, what can we do to make them better and make them touring specific and that led and specifically to the one Oh four, at which point they said, and it's going to be your signature model. It's going to be your pro model, yeah. bro. Hang on. You got hair and all. Look at that. It's going to be my pro model. <laughs> Somebody clip that, please. Actually, it's the wrong color. It's, these ones are better. Imagine, I love this. I love that you just have like 20 pairs of fucking pit vipers just on your desk right now. Like as a little. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, which was there again. I'm like, well, wait a second. Uh, pro model that that means that it's going to have this if i'm going to be involved in it i mean it's one thing to help out and we do some steering and we do some testing and we do these, some different things to help the touring collection but if it's going to actually say glenn plake on it uh then we've got some other um we've got some other parameters that we're going to probably have to work under and around um because i'm not going to just sign off on something that for the sake of some marketing scam, I could have done that with the K two fours years ago. And I didn't want to have anything a part of it. It probably would have been the most successful financial decision I ever made, but I wasn't going to play that game. Um, I said, so if we're going to do this thing, it's going to be kind of my, I'm going to say, I'm going to want some things and I'm not going to take the time to explain why I want them. I want to have the freedom to do what I, what I want, what I feel is good for the public. If I'm an endorsed athlete, as crazy as I may be, even let's say I was a world cup downhiller, 
And I decided that I should do something to make the make life better for the public. Um, I I think it's good for the public to, in fact, use what I created. I hope. I mean, I, I would try to. I, I've spent all my life doing this. I, you know, blah, blah, blah. You got to trust me that I think what I'm designing is going to be good for the public. And unfortunately, this, I don't think the ski industry realizes it that much, the athlete endorsement side of things and, or the athletes have been, uh, you know, designed something so far off that the public in fact didn't really need to <laughs> like, Whoa, wait a second. Let's not go that far. But so you have to, a little bit of a mix there, but I asked, I said, I, if it's going to be a one Oh four, then it's going to, it's going to have some, some, um, uh, it's going to have some things that I don't want to take the time to explain. There are things that I want and that's the way it's going to be. I don't need to, uh, explain it to you. And, um, um, and away we went and they said, oh, sounds good. It'll, you'll have final word. And I said, I don't want a lot of people involved because I've been involved in so many design projects where I get everything ready to go. Things are awesome. We're about 80%. This is going so great. And then uh, a retailer from Austria goes, well, don't you think this buckle is strange? <laughs> and yeah. 80,000 euros later and three months later, we're back to the same original idea because one person said something and all of a sudden there was a lack of confidence within the design team. And um, so we, we kept the design team very, very small, yeah. which was great. I like that a lot. How, how does it feel to be right? Like, I think that you were very correct in the way that this ski came out. I think mm -hmm. that it obviously took a little bit of a risk and Elon took a little bit of a risk, like kind of just being like, yeah. we trust them enough. Like, let's put this thing out there, but it's a really fucking yeah. good product. And again, we talked about the colors and the design of it. Like, and we'll touch yeah. on that real quick. Like it looks good, man. Like it looks like something that they, cool. they haven't made and that people will right. kind of attach themselves to. And it fits what your brand is, so to speak, you know? Well, Elon is such a cool company. I mean, I went, you know, when I, I went to Elon now 16 some odd years ago, um, I did it because they were an amazing ski company, an amazing country, an amazing group of people, an amazing uh, abilities to create skis and extremely passionate about doing just that, building skis and making skis. That's what Elon does. Um, and um, and so, um, uh, you know, being able to, let's say, get that story out a little bit, little by little by little by little, um, Elon right now is, is um, I think, a great – they've always been a great ski brand, but now I think there's no doubt about it. The public, I mean, I, I know there's Elans in the ski racks. There's Elans when I ski underneath the chairlift, I see Elans hanging from people's feet. And that makes me uh, really, really happy because for a long time I, I had Elans and most people just scratched their heads and were like, what are those and, and, and why or whatever. Um, and uh, so to, to have a, a ski and a project, and, and I got to go back to the ripstick too, which is another ski that I had a lot to do with. Um, that really, that was really a changing point, I think, for the company, uh, for people to realize that Elon is uh, is who they are, and 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 they could be a really good friend of yours if you're looking to buy some skis. And um, so, yeah, it was good. I mean, but there again, you know, the fact the first thing I said is we're not going to have very much side cut on these skis. I want as straight a ski as I can get away with. Um, you know, obviously they we sent a half a dozen different prototypes out. They tried to sneak a few curvy curvies in me, and I. I smell a rat pretty easy. And, <laughs> <laughs> but I, at the same time, I was open. I never touched the skis. I never looked down at the skis. Whenever I did all my testing, I, I was open. I mean, I was ready to say, okay, this is the radius we want. But um, it proved to be uh, the larger radius is where we went. I think it's important to have a ski that is designed to ski and mix snow to be able to make a mix of turns and nothing – has the ability to make more different turns than a larger re radius. It might take more physical input, like we were talking about skiing big skis earlier. Um, you know, um, you may have to put a little more physical input into the ski, but the ski has the ability to make a larger variety of turns. And in the, in the touring world, we need to be able to make all sorts of turns, whether it's a hop, skip, you know, check turn or, nice you know lay it out there s turns out on some doily powder field so be it um um i want to be able to control those i don't want the ski to do it where 
when you start dealing with side cuts, all of a sudden engineering starts coming into play and the skis turn the way they were engineered to turn. And that doesn't work in the real world. Yeah. It works on your groomer slope. It's awesome, but not in the real world. Yeah. Not when you're outdoor and the terrain's just too varied and it changes all the time, obviously. And that's obviously too much, one of the big, too many things. And, yeah, it's too much going on. And, and back to what we were saying about, or I was saying about the fat ski, you know, um, I want, uh, yeah, the top of the mountain, actually let's flip it over your typical day in Chamonix. The top of the mountain might be wind scour, absolutely hideous windboard. And all of a sudden I'm into the, let's say the middle range of the mountain it's blower, man. It, we're, we're, this is what we're supposed to be skiing on, right? It's way steep, incredible. But as we get lower down on the mountain, the sun got to it and now it's all melted out freaking potatoes. And then, Oh shoot, we're running a little late. Let's we're in the shade. Now it's the rotten potatoes has now refrozen, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and this is all in one, one run technically. So the ski needs to be able to go all over the place and it needs to be a good ski and, that moves in a touring environment, but also becomes this, we want it to ski well because the new modern world is not just go to hut to hut to hut. We're not just eating freaking granola and checking out the freaking say we skied from here to there. We're, we want to go skiing. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. It's funny you bring that up. Cause like when I tested the ski for the first time, it was probably like most variable terrain you could have. I skied it at sun Valley. It's past spring for the ski mag test. And it uh-huh. was, fucking horrible condition like the worst conditions that we could have had for a test right Bo- boilerplate most of the time and then the sun hit it all afternoon <laughs> and it was like complete mush and half of it was frozen and it was all over the place but they skied really well still like you still noticed that it was yeah. a really quality ski and i think that alone like any ski skis well in good conditions right like in in blower right, conditions right. in perfect groomers anything can make a turn right it's when stuff gets really hairy that you start to be like oh yeah I'm okay right now. So when we were testing, um, okay, yes, we went right, left, right, left, and did all these different things. But anytime I had a friend of mine test, we did a lot of testing at Mammoth, and we would get up to the, we'd go up to the top of the Mammoth gondola, and we would traverse because it's a touring ski, so you got to look at what I'm doing on this ski. We would traverse from the top of Mammoth gondola all the way over to chair twelve and not make one turn. All the way across the whole dang mountain, and the and uh, and it was same as you said. It was wind. It was it was springtime. It was refrozen. It was unfrozen. It was mu- and we, we wouldn't make one traverse. I'd traverse or one turn. I'd traverse, you know, five thousand linear feet and go. Okay, <laughs> kick turn. Let's go back the other way. Because to me, that's the, the that's the ski touring environment. That that you know we've we've skied. You know we've toured all the way up to some pass and now we got to do this big long contouring traverse and you know i want that thing to work yeah and so that that was the environment i tested for that's great so yeah it's cool it was really cool it's fun to be a part of and um we went to blows i mean i was ready to say no you can call it whatever you want but don't put my name on it <laughs> no kidding <laughs> what was the sticking um, point like we, what was the sticking point for them and for you that made you be like all right like i'll, I'll put my foot down I didn't want it. It wasn't skiing the way I wanted it to. Yeah. It wasn't skiing. Believe it or not, it wasn't skiing as easy as I wanted it to. No kidding. Yep. They kept sending me skis that were too gnarly. They were too burly. Yeah. And I guess they were too burly. (laughs) (laughs) And serious. I mean, serious. They were skiing. They were sending me skis that were too, too burly. They were too much. And I'm like, this, I don't want that. If I want that type of a ski, I'll go get a ripstick black and yeah. I'll get a- after it. And yeah. I had to really put my foot down to say, I want a easy ski. This thing has to ski easy. I might be tired. I might be this. At the same time, it's got to carry my weight. It's got to carry the backpack that I'm carrying. It's got to carry yeah. all these different things. Um, and it has to have some durability too. And so I was in Turkey last year and we had some basically no base tons of beautiful snow but no base so you're skiing along and all of a sudden you dry dock and it was almost dangerous because until we figured out what was really happening from the from the you know just flat out going on to rock um um and of the six pairs of skis that were there i'm the only one that ultimately didn't get a a, a base or excuse me a, a an edge fracture and i was on the lightest skis everybody else was on their regular alpine skis 
with touring bindings, like a, like a ripstick situation. And I was actually on my touring skis and, uh, and surprisingly, I'm the only one that didn't have edge failure. I, w- I thought that was a great testimony for the quality of skis that Elon builds. Cause here I am on the lightest ski, technically the most fragile ski. And I'm the only one that didn't, didn't, I had core shots all day long. I'm not saying I didn't hit any rocks, but I did not lose an edge or every other pair of skis took out an edge. No kidding. What- yeah, it's pretty cool. So to be able to build a ski that skis that easy and simple, that was the other thing I wanted to ski. I just wanted it to be a simple ski and ski. I didn't want some big complex freaking, yeah, pretty simple. And using the carbon rods and the tube, you know, that, that whole technology has really changed my, all of my opinions on how we make skis now, playing with those carbon fiber rods and tubes. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. fun. I, I got a couple more things for you and then I'll let you get out of here. But my, my last thing on yeah, the skis is... I'm enjoying it. Sorry about the yak. I haven't talked skiing in a while. It feels good. Thank no, you. No, dude, anytime. Uh, you're more than welcome. And I will I'll keep <laughs> going. I'm in, no, I'm in no rush, but I don't want to like keep you here all day because I'm sure we could be here all day. Um, yeah. My last ski-related question for like the ski itself. What Explain to people uh-huh. that don't necessarily understand the left and right thing. Okay? Like this feels... Okay. Even to me... <laughs> Like I, I work on skis for a living. I've sold right. a million pairs of skis in my young life. I still don't necessarily right. fully understand why this left and right situation exists. So can you explain it to me and explain it to everybody else? So it, it, it came about when I was trying to make a powder ski, when I was trying to give Elon's answer to rocker back when we, when everybody had more rocker and everybody had more width, I was, I asked myself the question, I was like, so what is it that we like so much about this? Why do we love this so much? And I took a, I I still, I have a giant ski collection. I took my old skis out. I had this old pair of 212 Super G's that I have over two or 300 days on. They were the old faithfuls. And I just thought to myself, what was it that I love these skis so much? I hadn't skied them in 10 years. And it was like, why? did I like these so much? What the hell was it that I loved them so much? And I came to find, or I came to the assumption that the skis were so beat up that there was no torsional rigidity in the tails. And so as I put the tails into powder snow, the skis wouldn't in fact flex on a long anymore. They were literally twisting. Yeah. The skis were twisting underneath my feet. And I explained this to an engineer and so he goes, huh? And he, we were testing some stuff. And cause I just, I hated rocker because like I said, yeah, it worked when the, we were up on the powder, but the rest of the time these suck. I mean, this is terrible. <laughs> I want my ski. I want my skis back. I mean, camber's cool as far as I'm concerned. It is. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> there's a lot of cool things about camber. <laughs> well, you did it for years. Trust me. There's, it can't be gone that quick. <laughs> um, and, um, and so we started, yeah, he, he started modifying the tips and the tails and to tell a, an Elon engineer at that time that they wanted torsional instability. That was like, yeah, right. I mean, here they are building right. race skis. And, um, anyways, they, they started playing with some things and I, it was really funny because a lot of the skis literally looked like it took a saw blade and they just chop, 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 chop. I mean, they do, we were just doing all these weird testing. Um, and then. Out of nowhere, this one pair of skis skied very, very interesting. And I was like, huh, interesting. All right, whatever, marked. And we weren't even really chasing this road. We were trying to just, we were just doing some testing on different things. And uh, a couple of weeks later, another test goes by. And, and uh, as being as, as, um, being as generic as you can, you're, you're trying not to look down. You're trying not to touch the skis. I don't. I try not to let anything influence me. I want to feel what it is, but I also realize it's that freaking pair of skis again. Yeah. <laughs> Strange. Hmm. Interesting. So we gave our test results. Anyways, um, the third time these things show up and now there's more of them. I'm like, these skis feel like B2 and this, uh, this. so, and all of a sudden what was happening at that point is we were confirming what was going on and what was going on was, the engineer decided to twist the skis mm. in the tip and the tail. So there was rocker on the outside edges, yep. but camber on the inside edges. 
There was no different in the side cut. There was no different in the flex. There was nothing different other than the tips were twisted and the tails were twisted. And I said, interesting. And it mimicked those old 212s that I love so much because all of a sudden the tails were, as I pushed them, they were laying over and they were flattening, yep. i.e. twisting. Um, so he was kind of preloading the ski um, to you know, to be twisted. I wish we would have called them twisted skis. Um, and so all of a sudden they were like, well, what can we do with it? And I'm like, well, I thought we were going to build a powder ski, but then they started putting them on the, at the time we were building a lot of race carvers. And the problem with the race carvers is they used to get edge lock, you yeah. know, and you'd just be like, Oh geez. And then away you'd go. Yeah. I remember <laughs> you know? this being a problem. And, yeah. You know, edge lock was so gnarly and we, so they put the amphibio technology on the race carvers or the fun carvers. Yeah. And it was met with like, Oh my gosh, this is insane. Absolutely insane. Because now you got this super fun ski. It was light. It was, you know, skiing like the early rise skis, but it still had all this edge power of the, of the carvings, you know, of a true camber ski. So that's where this, that's where the technology got debuted. Yeah. Years later, we're getting ready to make a powder ski ripstick sh start showing up. And I'm like, why aren't we playing with the, with the amphibio? I mean, the reason we kind of came up with this was to have an answer to more rocker, more rocker, more rocker, but at the same time still have a ski that laid down a, a pretty deep edge. And so we started making our prototypes with, um, with the amphibio. Uh, again, I, 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 my, I actually call them twisted skis, but whatever. Um, cause that's what they are. They're twisted. Um, and, uh, <laughs> And it made, uh, without a doubt, it made a, made a big difference on the wide profiles also. And then um, um, Elon being Elon and not necessarily having the cool factor of we can make garbage can lids and have everybody ski on them and they think they're great. Um, we had to come up with something, maybe a little bit of a niche, if, that, if, that's, if that, that's okay to say. And I said, yeah. fine, let's, you know, put, put right and lefts on our skis. That way it'll separate us from the others. Uh, as far as people saying, well, and I get it. I'm a friggin' ski bum. Uh, well, if I take out that edge, uh, then I, you know, I can't like swap the skis over and I'll end up with a right and a left. Or, you know, I, I can't, you know, what, what happens if I break the edge and two things, one, um, one, we have enough. We're pretty good at replacing edges nowadays. It's not the old days. I mean, let as you do a full blown core shot, you're taking it out, you're taking it out. Um, but I also go, wait a minute. So you want to switch skis over once you wrecked one of the edges. So you're going to have a right and a left ski. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, right. <laughs> like exactly, exactly. So let's just go ahead and start out with one. Um, I think it's a, uh, it's a wonderful technology that, that I, um, I don't, um, I, I, there's a lot, a lot of good to it for sure. No doubt about it for sure. Yeah. So anyways, does that explain it? Do I that need explains more? it. I mean, no, I think I think people will kind of get it from that. I think people kind of need to understand the origin and why it exists. and Because at some points you look at that kind of stuff, and I think like you think K2, Catamaran, K2, Marksman, those skis were technically ASIM skis, like they were asymmetrically correct, but they skied exactly the same both ways, right? The only thing that was different is K2 made up some like bullshit marketing story about, oh, like the powder pushes out as the skis push out right and this was maybe five years right. ago it, it doesn't make any sense it's not legitimate and there's like no basis to it and everybody started just switching it and it kind of became like a dead campaign so i think sometimes even though this existed first people associate those things together where right. we're like they exist kind of in the same vein we're like they're the only skis that were existing for the last few years being the ripstick and the catamaran and marksman in that same category. So people were like, okay, does it actually matter? Is there actually a purpose to it? And obviously Alon's answer was always, yes, there is a real reason for it. Can you ski it? Swapped? No doubt about it. You can ski it swapped, but it skis way better the correct way. It, it wasn't designed to be skied that way. It was designed specifically to ski. And again, it, it came down to the fact that I liked a cambered edge on the inside and I enjoyed the benefits of the rocker but we felt and we still believe that the, the rocker on the outside achieves the same, same, same. Um, it gives you all the feelings that you want on that rocker ski, but you get to feel the old cambered edge when you lay, you know, to the inside. 
Yeah. And um, yeah, that's that there again, it's uh, the skis aren't, and it doesn't change your tune. It doesn't change anything like that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, for sure. What, what's the Elon team like? Like it feels sometimes I look at the Elon team roster and I'm like, how does this relationship work between these people? Like, for example, Caroline Gleick and you are very different people. I don't know if you know this or not, mm-hmm. but like very different people. Very yeah, different. Yeah, very like, much so. Like, how, <laughs> how does the relationship, cause everybody calls like ski teams, right? But they're not really teams. Like you guys are just all athletes on the same roster. So when you guys have to come together to work right. together, what, what is that like? Do you have a good relationship with everybody on the team? Because you've kind of been there. You've been there for quite a while. I don't, I don't remember how long you said 16 years, something like that. You've been on the lawn. That's yeah. You, you've been there for a yeah. minute. So what, what is that relationship like with the whole team? I've, it's funny. I've been with Elon longer than I've been with K2 now as of last year. That's awesome. Isn't that weird? That's awesome. Scary to say, scary to say. And, and I, I can't even tell you how lucky I am that my, and I say career cause it is one it is. <laughs> uh, that it's still, still jamming along and I, it's freaking gifted and blessed and everything else, man. It's been a, been a crazy one. And especially when you start ex- actually putting dates to the, to the, to the, to the calendar, you're like, Whoa. Okay. Um, anyway, <laughs> aside from that, um, uh, I get, I, I have a great relationship with a lot of the European, um, um, testers and ambassadors because, uh, for the longest time, those are the only people that really skied Elon was the European, yeah. um, ambassadors. Um, there was a while there were, where, uh, um, Brad Holmes was involved with Elon and that was a lot of fun with him because me and him have a big history together. Um, and, uh, as, but as far as the, uh, the new team, the, let's say the ripstick era Elon team, um, that's a new group. Um, and I'm meeting them slowly, but surely, uh, I, they, I, I think they understand that they're on a brand that isn't necessarily, um, the same as other brands. Yeah. Um, but I, I think because, because they're choosing to go with Elon more than, than, um, the other way around sometimes, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, no, I, sure. I think you, like when I, when I went to Elon, it was like, no, I'm going to Elon and, and everybody went, you're whatever, man. And, you know, and you can make all the funny jokes you want, but, um, I had, um, the, there was things about Elon that I really, really liked. And, and that's why I went when I went, when the opportunity came. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the team, uh, I, you know, I think it's important that we all go out and do our own dang things. We're all, like I said, at the beginning, it's we're all individuals and we all have our own way of thinking and an MO of, of working and our ski days are similar, but even, even so what do you, you know, even our ski days are quite different depending on where we live and how we are and what, you know, what you do, what environment you're in. Am I out ripping bumps with my buddies? Am I out, you know, guiding? Am I, you know, um, am I doing the ski school? I mean, even my own personal days are changing constantly. So I think it's cool that the team is, uh, the team, the, the group is kind of as diverse as it is. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's also really cool that what you bring to the table at Elon, like, and you mentioned it was your choice. You, you consciously chose to go to Elon. And I think there's a lot of value in going to a brand, a brand that's not necessarily cool. Right. And bringing your own flavor to a brand that has that. Right. It's, it's funny four years ago or whatever, when we first started working with Fisher here, that was like the reason mm-hmm. they brought us on, right? They brought us on to like help them be something that they are not as a brand. Like Fisher objectively was not cool, right? And they're still very they similar they, situations. It, exactly. Very similar situations, very similar skis in a lot of ways, built very similar. The The goal was mm-hmm. kind of like to show that like, look, everybody can ski on this stuff and have a really good time, whether you're like an idiot podcaster or you're a skiing icon, right. like what, no matter who you are, you can get on this stuff and right. you can bring your own input to the table and they will listen to you and kind of appreciate the differences that that make you, you, me, me, the brand, the brand, like that stuff is actually, that's one of the reasons that right. I've enjoyed working with them so much is because you can have that relationship where you're like, look, this is a little edgy, but like, you got to trust me on this one. And they'll be like, look, this is in order and it's proper, but you got to trust me on this one. And everybody gives a little, everybody takes a little. No, I think it's, uh, especially from the ripstick tour project. Um, and again, I 
been with Elon a long time. We had a bunch of different projects together, um, you know, and, and, and as you were saying with, with Fisher, you know, you've got this European, I hate it when this happens, you'll hear, you'll be in a meeting and it'll be like, well, from our side and from your oh, yeah. side and yeah, from this side, and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa wait a second. And it, you know, cause you know, cause you think that the European and yes, there's differences between the European skiing and it, but anyways, um, I don't like having that separation like that. Um, but at the same time, when we got the the tour project, really gave everybody within the organization confidence to be Elon and to tell our story and to be proud of all our products and realize that we are leaders in ski design. We are leaders in model design, mm. which is more important for me. Model design is sometimes, you know, it's changing faster than the ski brand. You know, the brand's the brand, the model's the model. Um, and I'm really happy that all the people that I got to work with and the, the, and, and the Europeans that I, that I do work with and, and the North Americans that I work with, that um, it, 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 it kind of validated something that we've always kind of thought we were mm. and, and, uh, and gave them the confidence to say, no, we're going to launch and we're going to be extremely proud of this and, and, and go like heck. We're not just going to. We're not going to sell a lot of skis because of our sales force doing a great job and our prices are good. Right. People are going to want these dang skis and it's because of what we did that people are going to want these skis. And I just think that's cool. And I think you guys are in the same boat there with the Fisher crew. You know, there's this, this stigma of, of, um, you know, Northern European brands yeah. that, um, that, that come with this, kind of blockhead square mentality. I mean, you know, whatever it is, what it is. No, <laughs> but that's like, how no. people look at it. I remember like the first time we signed a deal, you're people like, were like, why, you know? Yeah. And you're like, yeah, you, exactly. <laughs> what the heck, dude, why aren't you skiing on whatever, whatever? And you're like, well, these are actually really nice skis. Yeah. You know, I, I had actually, when we were doing, when we were doing, uh, um, uh, ripstick, actually, I had some friends that were testing and they ski some other companies. And I said, I, I actually scored them some lift tickets one day. I'm like, but you need to test these. I need you to take a run on these skis. <laughs> and, and I love their comment because they're like, dude, I've skied on a lot of skis and hands down, Elans are like the nicest skis I've ever skied on, but they're not very fun to ski on. <laughs> and that was an interesting comment. I took that comment to heart because he was right. Yeah. They are the nicest. They were the greatest built skis but they weren't very fun to ski on. And that's when ripstick was being developed. It was like, I didn't, you get a test card and some guy would be like, Oh, it was a very edging ski. And I felt it. Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, throw yeah. that freaking card away. And don't ever let that guy test our <laughs> skis ever again. Yeah. The only, the only thing I liked was this was a really fun ski. You're like, okay, put that card on the top. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that, guy get, that guy gets a win. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Speaking of Fisher, man, one of the coolest things that ever happened that never happened, and I feel so bad, just a total blow up move, and we can certainly find a whole bunch of those, but when Fisher invented urban um, uh, cross-country skiing, yeah. that should have gone, <laughs> because I'm serious, man. <laughs> this is not where because I thought you were going, it. by the way. This is not where I thought no, you were going. No, that should have been the biggest thing ever, dude. Cause you got all these kids in the Northeast. You go back to JP Eau Claire's friggin' yeah. you know, neighborhood all I uh, can, yeah. session, you know, d yeah, all that. And think about it, dude. So think about that. Like you could have gone to school with like some sneaker looking skis <laughs> and skied all the way to friggin' school on your crisscross skis. And it would have been so much cooler oh. than like, e even in, you know, the, the urban rail scene. Well, yeah, okay, but you see me walking to school with my freaking ski boots on? Talk about <laughs> being a kook. I mean, my gosh. Where had that gotten developed, we would literally be like all the kids that live where there's snow and stuff. It'd be, it would be rad, dude. It would have been – but instead they had those guys, and they were extremely talented. You should find that video. I will. But they were all wearing like spandex condoms and stuff, and you're yeah. like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> there's a bunch – there's some kids down in West Virginia – that are badass at cross country skiing. Yeah, they all hang out. Their, their dad down there, uh, ki uh, Chip down there at uh, White Grass Ski Area. Yeah, and these are badass little friggin' cross country jibbers. They're all older now, but when they were kids, they were back flipping and throwing sevens and everything you could on your crisscross skis. And I was like, you blew it. You should have went and got those guys to debut your 
urban cross country skis. Oh my god! It would have gone off. <laughs> I still think it's potential. Maybe I just gave something away. Maybe we'll uh, maybe oh. we'll revisit this. This will be a video <laughs> bit that we do this season and as a promotion. The only, the, now you could take that exact same video and just put pit viper on it, and it'd go viral. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm gonna text Spencer as soon as this ends. Spencer and Landor are getting a text, and we're gonna figure this whole thing out. And uh, and this is gonna because be. A- you don't even have to refilm it. It's just all there. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing! Hey, I got a I got a random one for you. Have this okay. just occurred to me while you were talking about commuting, like or like urban cross country skiing? Uh, ripstick. Do you know what a ripstick is? Like the skateboard thing? Uh, oh, is that the one of the weird ones with like the hinge? Yeah, in the middle? dude, it's got the hinge in the yeah. middle where it's like a. It's almost yeah. like a scooter. I, it's it's funny. I used to have this kid in high school that would like commute like four miles, like going from his house. On a ripstick, yeah, uphill, downhill, yeah. And, and it pivots. It, yeah, like, it had it a hinge like in the middle. Yeah, that's what oh, a ripstick is. I've thought about that every single time I've read the word ripstick on an Elon ski, and I was like, that's really weird for like oh, these guys funny. and us, like for them to actually like think that that's what they want to do is name a ski after this stupid skateboard substitution. Well, so the ripstick was not named by that actually. The <laughs> ripstick was a special was a special edition. 162 race carver. They made 200 pairs for the PSIA um, pro buys. Yeah. And they called them rip sticks. Yeah. And that was the original. Then that name got shelved and they were coming out. We were sitting in one of these naming freaking meetings. Oh my gosh. Talk about agonizing. There's something we need to talk about to skiers. <laughs> like, you don't realize that if you're it, when you're in part of the ski industry, you have to sit in these name the ski meetings. Oh, yeah. oh it's a real thing. Gosh, it's a real thing. Suck. And I I was throwing out like because everybody's you know and everybody's like oh well you know Blizzard's using rodeo and blah 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 and that and, and so and so is using mountain tops and I was I was like let's use big time wrestler names. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what the hell's the difference? Uh, you know, and it was like oh let's use um. I, then another one I, I wanted to use um, uh, nicknames for wartime aircraft. <laughs> that- <laughs> but then they found out that they're like, oh, no, no, that'd be terrible. That You can't do that. That's like, no, oh my gosh, you can't reflect war. I'm like, oh. all right, whatever. A bad idea. Sorry. Oh. And then out of nowhere, I was like, how come we don't use ripstick anymore? What happened to the ripsticks? And, and everybody went, well, that, that was the carving ski and blah, blah, blah. And lo and behold, it, it bounced around and, and ripstick stuck. But um, yeah, naming skis is a huge ordeal. Huge it, ordeal. It's crazy that that sells skis. Like the name of the ski actually matters. Like I, it's yeah. I don't know, man. That's a tough. That's a tough one. That's a tough conversation it's, too. Because like that's a thing. That's like so in the weeds, so inside baseball that people are going to be like, "What? This is a thing that people actually think about?" Because I think people think it just comes out oh, of the box dude. and it is what it is. And they're all registered 90, like any cool name that you think of is already <laughs> registered. Trust me. Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> that's, that's just how Speaking of, I'm going to give I, And I, with that said, I got to call out freaking Hatrip and Fisher and all you freaking clowns <laughs> for stealing gun barrel. For oh a yeah. Ski. How come I didn't think of that? I grew yeah. up on that damn run. <laughs> well done. Touche. Touche. It's a good looking ski. I feel like they're killing it unbelievable. next year. Unbelievable. I might be wrong. I think they're killing it next year, but I could be wrong. We'll see. Hopefully not. Cause that's key sells. Well done. That's hilarious. That's hilarious that you've yeah. taken, that you've taken note. I of called my mogul ski, the bloodline. Cause I was trying to like, uh, bring, uh, a, a, a certain amount of genealogy of like a racehorse, you know, a thoroughbred racehorse, <laughs> how there's this bloodline and, and, um, and, and mogul skiing is the same way. There's a bloodline now, believe it or not, mogul skiing is 60 some odd years old. Yeah. <laughs> That's you crazy. know, and there's this, there's this bloodline, there's this genealogy of, of mogul skiing. And, and then out of nowhere, you guys, oh my gosh, what a, <laughs> what a great name. Well done. I promise well done. I had nothing to do with that uh, for better, or for worse. That's the, <laughs> that's the team upstairs for sure. But no, it is crazy how you pick a ski and then everybody runs with it and they get their name and then away you go. And, and yeah, the, the, the normal public listening to this podcast has, go, yeah, I'm sure they're like, what are they talking about? Why don't you just call it? Imagine being like a part of a car company trying to name cars. That's why oh, cars have such weird names. Huh? I know. 
I feel like they just like recycle old ones at this point. And like ski companies do too. Like they just take a five. Oh yeah, break. definitely. Look at like Nordic Enforcer, right? Like that ski is, yeah. was the most popular ski in the world. Still might be for so long. And all they did was just like take a ski that sucked ass and brought it back. Right. And like everybody loves it now. Right. Cause the name was good. The ski was bad. Absolutely. So they just figured out a way to make it work. It's just how it goes. Absolutely. That's really funny. No, funny. Yeah. So Ripstick was recycled from, uh, and I don't know who called it the Ripstick initially. I'm sure it must have been one of the U.S. sales force or something because it was a U.S. sales, it was a U.S. only, um, like, you know, pro buy, the original yeah. Ripstick. Huh. No kidding. So, not so it's probably off. Northeast rep. May have been one of the Northeast reps or Midwest rep or something. Yeah. So not sure. Not the skateboard. Okay, good. I'm glad I got some clarity on no, that. No, it's one. not the skateboard. Uh-uh. Yeah, and there's didn't people. It, didn't it look like isn't it like an hourglass shape? Yeah, it's like got a little pinch in the middle yeah. and then you like wiggle yeah, your yeah. legs separately. It's like if your snowboard had No, like it's a not little, that. Yeah, it's it's, it's rough. not that. I'm surprised there's no copyrights. Maybe we'll stop talking about this. Um no, yeah. Like um what were those little worm things that they sold around that same time? The Smurfles or <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot Smurfles. of weird shit with wheels with wheels now. Like that. Uh, what are those things called? One wheel. They were like fuzzy little worms, and you tied a string on your finger. And oh made yeah, yeah, yeah. Squiggles. <laughs> <laughs> it is like that. It's just the wrong. It's like this way or this. Ronco. I don't know how to- Ronco. Now I'm showing my age. When I when I was a kid, I used to go to my grandmother's, and they actually had television there, and they'd have Ronco commercials, and it was always like these toys that you that look cool in the commercial. I think once you got them, they sucked. Yeah, they're horrible. Except for a frisbee. Frisbees work pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the only one that's stuck is frisbees. That's amazing. Um, Hello. All right, I'm going to let you go in a minute here. Last question I have for you, though. Oh, I'm fine, man. I'm lot- thoroughly enjoying it. We're, <laughs> we're, we're helping somebody drive across the country right now. <laughs> I This is actually a valid <laughs> point. It's funny because sometimes I get feedback and they're like, oh, episode's too long. Sometimes I'm like, oh, dude, you should have went two more hours. And I'm like, all right, man, like, I can't fucking please. I can't please everybody. What do you want me to do? Like, it is what it is. Somebody's stuck in traffic trying not to shoot the person next to them. <laughs> yeah. And they're finding out about ripsticks and naming skis and all this stuff. So, um, there's a lot of, there's a decent amount of younger athletes that listen to this show. So I guess one of my main questions, and I always ask this to people, it, but you're probably one of the better people to ask your career has been extremely relevant the whole way through. It feels like, and now it's just as relevant to me at least as it was Mm -hmm. 20 years ago. How do Mm -hmm. you manage that type of thing? What do you have? Like what kind of insight can you offer to keep yourself one, just you as a person interested in being in the sport and being in the industry, but also just like making a living doing it. It's one of the hardest things to do in this industry is like, and everybody always talks about it is get paid. Right. It's like you got to get enough mm-hmm. money so that you can have an existence, that you can have a career, and you can keep going. So, how do you do that mm-hmm. for as long as you've done it, and how do you do it just to make sure you're happy doing it? Because if it co- becomes too much work, then it's like there's no point in doing it. There's plenty of jobs out there that can suck that you can make way more right. money. You know, so how do you keep that right. love for it, and how do you make it last? Um, I think, who. Uh, that, there's a lot, lot, a lot of answers to that question. There's a lot of, a lot of parts to that question. Yeah. Um, but I, um, I, um, I think it's, I think the, if I look back to maybe the base of it, and then I can, I'll tell you some things that I've kind of maybe come up with along the way. I think it's okay to have pride in what you have and do. Mm. I think it's okay if you're trying to find yourself in the industry or whatever you're doing, I think it's okay to be proud of what you're doing and be proud of what you've done um, without being boisterous. Of course, um, when I was a, a young mogul competitor and I was got my first pair of skis, um, I was helping a ski, a local ski rep with a demo day. And he introduced me to some people that were going to try out his skis and they, um, and he said, Hey, do you guys know who Glenn is? Well, of course they don't know who Glenn is. I was a 15 year old <laughs> mogul skier. And, but he went ahead and said, well, Glenn just won the, the regional championships here. This is probably the best mogul skier in our area. And, uh, Glenn, why don't you go out and ski with these people and, you know, and show them how the skis work. And it was, and I had to sit there and go, well, yeah, I, I did win that. I did, 
you know, do this. Uh, later on, when all of a sudden I was on the cover of a magazine or I was in a, you know, in a centerfold of a magazine or, and I had, I got invited to go to a ski shop to, to, you know, help with ski sales. There had, I had to have a certain amount of pride to maybe introduce myself and say, yes, this is me. I'm the, I'm on the cover of this magazine. So who are you again? Well, I happen to be on the cover of the magazine and I'm in some ski. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. And so I, I you know, there's a difference between introducing yourself through your achievements than just saying, I'm the freaking badass. You see me on the cover of the magazine. And yeah. I was able to like introduce myself to people. I've heard it before. Well, yeah, you can go sign autographs. Hell you're Glenn Plake. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I, I became Glenn Plake. I became through a certain amount of pride. And I just, I think it's, and I, I, I gotta be, I don't mean it. I'm not full of myself in any way. I'm not saying right. that, but I think it's important. If you're striving to be an athlete, then you have to, or striving to be, you know, that part of the industry, you have to, even with your podcast, you've got to be proud of it. For sure. Look what I'm doing. Yeah. Damn right. Look, look what I'm doing. Yep. For sure. And, and I just, I think it's important. If you don't have that, then do something else. Because unfortunately in this field, you got to have a little bit of pride. Yeah. Um, and then, but then, then at the same time, you got to be inspire yourself. And if you, and now I'm going to speak a couple of cliches because they are, they are cliches to me, but I live by them. But if I, if, if I've had the opportunity to inspire other people and I have, then I got to make sure I inspire myself and I continue to inspire myself. Otherwise, what right do I have inspiring somebody else? And so if that is going and skiing some steep ass line or going and skiing with some little kid or riding my damn bicycle 500 miles because it's a stupid idea that I came up with, mm -hmm. if that inspires them and lets people know that I'm still inspiring myself, then that's what gives me that longevity. I'm also extremely curious. I, I want to know what's around the other corner. I want to know what that is like. Mm. I want to find out what's going on. And, and I think that has helped me over the years to continue to keep going and feel like I'm not out of place. I mm. don't, you know, I mean, not that I, I'm not in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm not, I don't, I don't need okay. to belong, but I also, I don't want to feel that I'm like, I don't belong here because I do belong here. Um, there's an old adage that I read on a skateboard ad years and years ago that said, uh, to evolve, you must be involved. Mm. Well, I try to stay involved. I'm, I'm, I'm always involved in something. I, I can't involve, I can't be involved in everything, but yeah. if we're going to go design a ski touring ski, then gosh dang it, I'm going to be full on in touring mode. If mm. you told me next year, we're going to go design a mogul ski. Well, guess what? I'm going to start calling up all my mogul buddies and we're going to go dive in and I'm going to, I'm going to get involved in that more than I already am, yeah. you know, so that I can, that I can do it. The other, I guess, another thing that I find interesting about skiing and I love one of the things I love about skiing, again, kind of going back to an old kind of a punk rock adage of it's an all ages show. Mm, that's very true. Period. And I don't think that the mind of, of um, Herman Golner or the mind of John Clon Denon or Bob Salerno or any of the other 70s freestylers is any different than the mind of Bruce Bolesky or, or um, uh, I'm trying to come up with some of my 80s, 80s uh, John Eves, all these different guys. Um, myself uh all through the the 90s extreme skiers and tanner hall and whoever is at a park tomorrow doing something crazy or any of the great big mountain skiers right now i really don't think our mind has gone through an evolution in the last 60 or 70 years that makes us any different than each other I think the first time we all did backflips is the same damn thing we all felt. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to be the same thing we all feel in the next 50 years. Okay, I'm getting ready to back one over. Here we go. You know, I mean, the tricks have, of course, 
progressed beyond a level that I could ever achieve. But the reality is, um, you know, that, that mindset is still the same. And I think that's that physical, that's the physical evidence of it's an all ages show. It's yeah. it. I just don't think we're a whole lot different. Our bodies might be different. The tricks we might be do are different, but I don't think we as people and humans are any different. I think we're really the same, actually. Very, or we're similar to each other. It's a very interesting. And point. Uh, and I, I think that's what's kept me along. You know, I, um, and I, I'm healthy. That's be- that's another. Thing. I've taken care of myself. Um, I found early on that I probably shouldn't drink and smoke, um, because all that was doing was getting me prison time. And, uh, and that obviously I think helped my, um, uh, that helped my physical aspect. So I am lucky that I have the physical abilities that I have mm. that allows me to continue to do the things that I, I want to do and, and can do. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, as, that's as good of an answer as I could have asked for, you know, like that. I think, <laughs> well, I think people are, it, it's hard, right? I think in this, this burnout thing that everybody talks about right now is so real. Like, and that's uh, uh-huh. that's such a thing that people, when somebody's trying to make this their job, right. They, they experience right. that because now you're associating this thing that you love so much and you enjoy doing so much with getting a paycheck and making sure that you can make a living. And there's, there's a lot of stress in that, right? Like, Especially if you don't have something yeah, real to well, fall that, back yeah. on, you know? So it's, I think, finding that balance and figuring out a way to make it all kind of work together and make it all work together long enough for it to happen for you and for you to still enjoy doing it is, is like, really kind of a secret sauce. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's important to, you know, uh, change into Elon, for instance. Uh, that was an opportunity that, you know, the, the door opened. And then you have to decide, am I going to walk through that doorway? What's on the other side of that threshold? I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> you yeah. know, and the way you go, you know, um, you know, um, and I think that's important. Also be ready for uh, opportunities to come your way. And I, I'm a big believer. If the opportunity is there, then I should be walking through that doorway, even though it might not make perfect sense uh, at the time. It's uh, it's yeah, it's, it's a go. Whether, whether even without my with in my non skiing related stuff, you know, I mean, some of my motorhead stuff that I enjoy doing because that's a pastime of mine, also. So, but you get dumb opportunities and you, you go, yeah, let's go. And then the next thing you know, you're you're it's it's a really really you know great thing that you can't believe you had the opportunity to do. Um, and I, I again back to that pride thing, I guess is 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 um, you know if these companies are going to support young athletes and support ambassadors. Um, you gotta, you gotta compensate them. And that's, that's part of it. And I've, I, I know in the era of snowboarding, there was a lot of maybe overcompensation. Yeah. Um, certainly mm-hmm. sounded like it. Um, and I, I'm not going to believe all the rumors, but there was a lot of money flowing around. And I think, but at the same time, if, if someone's doing some work for you, um, you know, you gotta, you gotta, compensate them in one way or another, you know, the old days, Oh, well you get to keep the skis and you get to keep this and you keep that. And you're like, wait a minute, you just, you're going to occupy this person's life for a period of time. And then you want the right to use their mm. um, light name and likeness mm. and everything to build your brand. And you don't want to help them. Well, what kind of commitment is that? That's, that, that's pretty cheesable. I used to hate, I never have ever signed a photo incentive in my life. Hmm. Because I felt that that was a lack of commitment from the company. Right. Yeah. Pay me, pay me a flat rate, pay me less than you want to pay me less than I want to, but don't give me these little photo incentives. Don't give me tidbits because that just means lack of confidence in you and me. And it's you not trusting me to go out and promote your brand. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. That's a, that's a really interesting point. You know, and especially in the days, the age of, of, you know, the Instagram hits and the Facebook hits and all this different stuff. I mean, people were getting paid because they had likes. You get a quarter a like. I mean, yeah. first of all, it was dangerous to do that. But two, um, yeah, whatever. You know, I tell everybody all the time. I'm like, if if you had a, I don't have a whole lot of followers, but I guarantee you, if you have a dead battery out on the highway in the middle of Nevada right now, you post something on my Instagram, someone's coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fucking flex, dude. That's a thing. That's a, that's a really good one, man. I'm going to recycle that one for sure. Holy shit. (laughs) 
you know, because it's real. People care. Yeah. And we're all, you know, it's real. It's real. Yeah. And that matters. Yeah. That really matters. Yeah. And no, I, 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 there's a lot of opportunities um, that have come to skiers that I wish I was in the management position for them to, um, to have allowed them so that there was a whole bunch more Glenn Plakes walking around or doing whatever, because, um, a lot of opportunities came and unfortunately they were mismanaged or mishandled and they weren't allowed to, to capitalize on the, on the, on the chances that they had. It bothers me. Actually, I see some, some, some careers that kind of didn't necessarily get to get to fulfill like they could have. Yeah. You see that a lot, actually. You still see it. You see it all the time where people are like, they're extremely uh-huh. talented and they just don't have the, I don't know what it is, but they just don't have the no, right? They don't, they don't know what to say. They right. don't know what to do. They don't know how to ask for my, and that's the thing that like, I talk right. about this a lot. So probably sound a little bit like a broken record, but you got to ask for what you think right. you're worth and who, who cares? They come back and right. they say like, Oh, you're worth half of this. Then you have a conversation, but like, you gotta ask, like you gotta try and like actually find what your worth is and make that shit happen. Yeah. And, and it, again, I, I've not been paid as much as others, I'm sure. But I, when we, when we got to the end of the deal, we knew where both of us were and we really cared a lot about each other on both sides of, of the uh, agreement. Yeah. And I think that's more importantly than, um, than yeah, you, got paid like heck for two years. And then what happened to you? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. That's for sure. How it goes. Um, yeah. Cool. Anyways. Anyways. Uh, yeah. I, I think I answered it. I hope I did. That, I think you but did I, too. I, yeah. I, um, I definitely take it. I take it serious. I mean, I, I know I'm in, I, I, again, back to that. I've had the ability to influence a lot of people and I don't take it for granted at all. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. It's it's very real. Like that's how it goes. Glenn, I'm gonna let you get out of here. Um, okay. I I very much appreciate the time. Uh, I'm sure people know where you are on Instagram. Same here. And all this good stuff. But where can people find you on the internet if they want to reach out to you? If they want to shoot you a message on Instagram, what's your what's the old Instagram handle? Glenn Plake. That's it. Glenn Plake with one N. The OG. Just that's it. I'm o- I, I'm verified. Oh, you got the check. <laughs> <laughs> oh my <laughs> i i guess it's a big deal but i am <laughs> <laughs> by accident that's hilarious it's like oh this is me this is me i got the blue check i love that um but yeah glenn plague's the best um yeah i don't i don't have a website i i yeah yeah i'm, people I'm easy to get hold of <laughs> yeah people know where to find you people know where to find you i love that Cool. But yeah, that, that, that would be the one. Um, there's a couple of Facebooks, but they're not, they're not me actually. They're fan pages or something. I don't know. But yeah. Um, yeah. Instagram, <laughs> Instagram is the real you. Instagram is the, the Instagram you. is the real me. And I, I probably should have taken this whole thing more serious, but whatever, here we are. I'm a live show, dude. <laughs> no, I love this. No, this is what it should be. Honestly, like, and this is, this is what it should be. Like, it should just be a conversation. Like, I don't have to do like, this is, does it's not a quiz. You know what I mean? Like, it should just be talking about nah. what you want to talk about. So I, I like this. I very much appreciate it. This is, uh, this is what it should be. I appreciate it. Thanks for asking. And, you know, it's, I used to love doing magazine and articles and different things. And, and, um, it's nice to be, uh, um, yeah, I have this opportunity. Like I said, I, I, I take opportunities very, very serious. So I appreciate you guys uh, reaching out to me and, and, uh, including me and, and, uh, look forward to hearing the comments uh, yeah. from people that I guarantee will have taken the time to listen to us <laughs> gab about something or another. For sure. And thank you. If Ben, if this makes it out there, Ben, I appreciate the hookup. This has been very good. So shout out to Ben. Yeah. Ben's a man. So. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to all the people that help us, uh, along the way. There's no doubt about that. Whether yeah. I, 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 there again, why am I around? Probably cause my wife, Kimberly, I'd probably be, yeah, I'd probably, <laughs> <laughs> there's, I can't imagine what I'd be without Kimberly over the years. She definitely, uh, helped me along the way. And, and then all the marketing people that I had along the way, Ben included, you know, all, I've just had really, really wonderful sales reps that, you know, brought me to the small towns, brought me to ski areas, brought me to ski shops, and got to 
show people that magazine or whatever where that I was the cover and I got to sign it and give it back to them and, and say, you know, and I, in the world of the internet, it's funny. I, 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 I've been signing posters my whole career and, and um, it's so cool to see a poster that I've signed two or three times. Cause it's still hanging on the, on the wall at the ski shop or at the Dang. ski area. And, and I, while I certainly think it's funny that we can do this like live time reporting on Instagram and stuff, but um, it's pretty hard to find what was going on a year ago or two years ago Totally, where those old posters and those old magazines sitting around They're they're still hanging out. And, and uh, I, they, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty funny to put that, uh, to put the real life part of it. And I think that's important for any young, young skier, or next person, up, you know, coming above too. I mean, your opportunity to meet people and sign somebody's skis or sign a hat or give them something that is physical proof that mm-hmm. we got to hang out with each other. That's what an autograph is. It's not freaking some boisterous thing. It's physical proof that we got to hang out and I got to tell a story or you got to tell a story and, and, uh, and look, here's proof. I met him, you know? Yeah. It's cool. It's a real thing. <clears throat> That's a real thing. Yep. I love that. Um, awesome. All right, buddy. Um, I will let you go. 